stopped really abruptly. Can you hear me? Awesome. Um, so I'm Fraser. I'm the CTO of Cubis, and I'm also faculty at CMU, where I work on like program correctness and verifying real-world programs. And I'm going to start with the really obvious, which is that software bugs are bad, and we all hate them. Um, why? Well, they're really annoying, right? It sucks when your browser crashes. It sucks when you have to restart your phone. In the DeFi world, whoops, there we go. You have to push it really hard. Um, in the DeFi world, bugs can translate directly to lost funds. We've seen all sorts of smart contract and bridge hacks that have you know, cost millions of dollars. And finally, since software is so ubiquitous, it you know, controls everything from cars to planes to trains, software bugs can even have some amount of human cost, right? So instead of putting up with bugs, let's just get rid of them, right? Let's build machines that tell us when our software and our smart contracts are wrong. But I'm going to spoil this like, little fantasy a bit up front here and say that, unfortunately, there's some bad news. We just can't do this. In the general case, building machines that tell us if other machines are correct is just not possible. So let's start by walking through why. Why can't we do this? Why can't we you know, build these perfect bug-finding oracles? And I'm going to start by narrowing this question quite a bit before we expand it out again in a few more slides. And I'm going to start by asking, why can't we build machines that ask if other machines terminate? So to make that concrete, um, here's a little line of code here that clearly terminates, right? Since this loop only executes four times, it clearly holds. In contrast, this, whoops, this um, line of code down here does not halt. It will loop forever, kind of uselessly incrementing x on every iteration. And it's pretty easy to look at these two programs and say, OK, this one halts, this one doesn't halt. Um, but it's much harder to do that in general. It's much harder to build a program that takes in an arbitrary program and determines whether or not it halts. It's actually impossible to do. And let's talk through why. And there's a warning. Coming up, there is a very broken bug in my next few slides. So they are not the correct proof intuition. You're going to have to ignore one not operator. You all on board with that? Thank you for nodding down. OK, so first we're going to assume the existence of this halting Oracle procedure. It takes some program P as input and returns true if it halts, false if it doesn't. Um, assume it's on you know, some sort of input. And we're going to use this halting oracle to actually show that the halting oracle itself is impossible. Here is our broken pseudocode uh, to break the halting oracle. It's a recursive function. It's a function that calls itself. And first, the procedure determines whether or not the halting oracle thinks it halts. And here, we're ignoring the not operator. And we're saying, OK, if the halting oracle thinks we halt, then don't halt. Just defy the halting oracle, right? Just keep on looping. And thus, in like two lines of pseudocode, we're able to create a program that actually breaks the halting oracle and shows that such an oracle just is impossible, cannot exist. So this procedure is really bad news for determining if programs terminate. But why should it be such bad news for like finding bugs in arbitrary programs, right? It turns out we can actually reduce program properties like, hey, does it have integer overflow? Or does it have a bug? to the halting problem. So that means we can use an oracle for any arbitrary program property, non-trivial semantic property, really, but just think of it as like program behavior, to solve the halting problem, too, which means that such an oracle also cannot exist, right? If you can build the halting oracle with something and the halting oracle is impossible, well, the thing you build the halting oracle with is also impossible. So now, um, whoops. No, forward. Ah, OK, good. So now instead of our halting oracle, we have an oracle for whatever property we want. In this case, we're choosing squaring, but it really could be anything. Um, so it takes a program and an input, and it gives us a thumbs up if the program actually returns a square on the given input, and it gives us a thumbs down otherwise. And we can actually use is squaring to break our halting oracle, or to uh, build a halting oracle. So this is the pseudocode. 
and it takes a program and an input and returns true if the program halts on the input. First, we build a subroutine inside of our halting oracle. This subroutine will return two times two, which notably is a square, if our input, P, or input program P halts on input I. Um, so to do so, first it runs P of I, and then next it returns two times two. That's our square. So this means square if halts can only return two times two if P at I halts, right? Otherwise, it'll just loop forever. And the final step is just to invoke our squaring oracle. Since square of halt certainly returns a square if P of I terminates, asking if P of I is squaring is the same as asking if P of I is halting. So therefore, we've successfully used the squaring oracle to build something we know is not possible. And this means that squaring oracles and any other oracle for any other kind of bug you want, well, not that squaring is a bug, but you know what I mean? All of those things are just totally impossible. So maybe this makes you a bit uncomfortable though, right? Like how are there all of these smart contract verification and bug finding companies if bug finding and program verification are impossible? Um, and the answer is that while perfect bug finding is impossible, actually imperfect bug finding is very, very doable. We can build tools that find bugs in some programs but not others, or tools that verify program correctness under certain conditions, or tools that will find you bugs but also flag false, false positives as well. And so that, what that means is no matter what tool you use, you're actually going to have to make a bunch of trade-offs. That's just the you know, sad truth of the Halden problem. And there's this sort of spectrum of correctness here, going from fast, easy to build tools that can maybe find bugs but give you no guarantees, all the way to slower, harder to build and use tools that give you promises but certainly not perfection like we just talked about, right? And I'm gonna start by talking through a relatively simple strategy, which I'm gonna call heuristic bug finding, static checking, something like that. Heuristic checking basically means combing through programs to find stuff that looks weird or stuff that kind of smells wrong. And here's an example of something sort of wrong looking in source code. This is a logical rule violation. It's a null check of P followed by a dereference of P. If P could be null, it shouldn't be dereferenced, right? So this is just sort of wrong looking code. And the heuristic static checking pipeline kind of looks something like this to identify those rule violations like the one we just talked about. You take some source code you want to check, and then com the compiler compiles it into some kind of program representation, a graph representation of code that's like that, but bigger, easy to reason about, easy to optimize. Here's a zoomed in program graph. And now this is where the static checker comes in. It walks through the program representation looking for these rule violations. Let's say, in this case, dereferences of a variable after that variable has been checked against null. And let's actually do a simplified version of this check by keeping track of a set of variables that could be null, that have been checked against null. At this node, p is checked against null, so the checker is going to add it to the maybe null set. Then, at this node, the checker sees a dereference of p. Since P is already in the maybe null set, that's kind of a contradiction, right? P shouldn't be dereferenced if it may be null. So the checker is going to report an error. Either the check is wrong or the circle dereference could crash. So it's found a bug or some logical error of some kind. And the checker found the bug in this case, but it won't in every case, right? It has to approximate around things like control flow, for example, and more importantly, actually, there are many kinds of bugs this sort of checker can't find, right? It can only find bugs that are obvious from like staring really hard at a program or like reading it a few times as a human. There are other simple strategies that can find somewhat deeper logical bugs or bugs that deal with value reasoning. One of those strategies is fuzzing, a simple, pretty popular technique that finds actually really nasty errors. And so at their most basic, fuzzers just run programs on random inputs. Here's the very simplified pipeline as visual. Feed programs random data. If they crash, you found a bug. Do it again, forever. Um, but as you can imagine, feeding programs truly random data is not a recipe for success. Um, so instead, the real fuzzing pipeline usually looks something like this. You start with a corpus of valid inputs. So to fuzz an image parser, say, you might like 
scrape a bunch of images from the internet. Then the fuzzer is going to randomly select some input from that initial corpus and mutate it in a sort of random way, right? It might take an image and then flip some bits in the image. Um, okay. Um, next, the fuzzer executes the image parser or whatever um, on the mutated input. If the input causes a crash, great news. We're trying to find bugs. Success. If the input doesn't crash but does cause you know, the program to execute some code that's never been executed before, say, also great. The fuzzer is going to add that input to the corpus where it could be mutated further on in like more loops of the fuzzer, right? Because the fuzzer is just doing this forever in a loop. You can tailor this fuzzing loop to really specific sorts of programs like smart contracts by changing notions of coverage or changing the mutation strategy. And fuzzers actually uncover really serious bugs in huge security critical code bases all the time, right? Like Chrome, Firefox, all those things. But still, this strategy gives us no promises about the bugs that exist or don't exist in the program. Um, so for that, we're going to take a bit of a leap into something called abstract interpretation. Um, in essence, as it sounds like, abstract interpretation lets you run programs abstractly as opposed to concretely in order to prove the absence of bugs. Um, so if the abstraction doesn't have bugs, the original program certainly doesn't have bugs. Um, the downside, though, is false positives. The abstract version of the program could contain bugs that actually kind of don't exist in the concrete version of the program. Um, so I'm going to describe the abstract interpretation pipeline at a pretty high level, but if you're interested, feel free to ask questions after. Um, so to abstractly interpret, we need to know what program property we're analyzing. The really canonical example here is sign analysis, figuring out if a variable is positive, negative, or zero at each program point. Uh, so this analysis is really helpful if you want to say find divide by zero bugs. And now that we know we're going to do sign analysis, we can take our concrete program right here and turn it into an abstract program. So in this first line, the abstract interpretation framework knows that 5 is a positive number and that y can be kind of anything. And therefore, the framework says the sine of x is the sine of a positive number plus the sine of anything. Well, that could be anything, right? Hmm. So we don't know what the sine of x is. Next, it knows the sine of z is the result of the sine of x times 0. Um, well, we don't know the sine of x, but we do know the sine of 0. That's just 0. So hey, we actually know the sine of 0 is 0. Good news. We can think about the sine of w in a similar way. We know the sine of z. We just said it was 0. 0 minus a positive is always going to be a negative, so the sine of w is always going to be a negative. And we can go on like this to determine the sine of every variable in the program. There are two problems with this. First, the pesky don't know that we talked about, right? Often a variable is neither always positive nor always negative, right? We, sometimes it could be either. The second problem is control flow, kind of like with heuristic tracking, but I'm just going to ignore that for now. That's really a rough problem, though. Um, so now that we've covered abstract interpretation, the last strategy I'm very briefly going to talk about is the rough category of solver-aided verification, stuff like what Sartora is doing and what Chandra talked about before. Um, so this is, again, a simplification, and there are deep connections with abstract interpretation. Um, but solver-aided verification, the high-level idea is convert programs into logic and then ask a specialized logic solver if bugs are possible. So as an example, let's say we want to figure out if there's an input that makes the return value of this program 0 or an input that makes the return value of the program 12. The verification tool does this reasoning by translating each line of code into a logical formula, something like this. Either the return value is 0 or the return value is 12, corresponding to both paths through the program. Then the tool feeds these constraints to that logic solver I was talking about, an SMT solver, which gives a satisfying assignment to the formula, an assignment that makes the whole formula evaluate to true. So in this case, it's found an assignment where the return value is 0, um, but note it doesn't have to provide one specific assignment, right? Um, it just needs to make the formula true, so it could have made ret 12 instead and x, you know, anything else. And if the formula isn't satisfiable, say if it includes like the assertion that ret must be 3 and 0, 
and, sim or, and simultaneously 0 or 12, which is what's up there. The SMT solver tells us so by saying unset. Nope, not possible. So in much the same way we've added this constraint asking about the return value and if it can be three, we can add constraints that encode questions about other kinds of bugs, like is an integer overflow possible? Is a null pointer dereference possible? And the astute listener will worry that we've stepped into a contradiction, right? Because didn't I just tell you this kind of reasoning is impossible? And you're right, it is in the general case. Uh, for some theories, solvers just won't terminate at all. There's no termination guarantee. Um, but they do give us a structured way of asking questions about programs. And they also give like really good engineers something to optimize. So if many verification tools are using the same logic solvers that people have poured, you know, tens of years in fork into, we actually can tractably like solve real world verification problems, which is pretty cool. Um, we can even ask if our programs conform to entire specifications of correct behavior. Um, so I'll leave you with this little map of imperfect bug finding. There are all sorts of other kinds of strategies and they all fall somewhere on this guarantee and effort map um, because building machines that verify other machines is in the fully general case impossible. Um, so thank you, that was fun. Um, come ask questions later if you have them. <laughs>